Praise the Lord, church. While we stand across this house on a midweek service, let's magnify the name of Jesus in this house. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. God, we love you, oh, Father. Oh, Father, we thank you, God, for allowing us to be in your house tonight, Lord. God, we come to give you great praise. We come to worship you. We come to magnify your holy name. We believe, God, that you inhabit the praises of your people. Oh, God, we thank you, Lord. Let your spirit let your spirit flow through us, in us, and with us right now. In the name of Jesus, oh, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus, oh, God. Oh, hallelujah, Father. We praise you. We love you, oh, God. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
those hands and praise him a little bit right now let's come on there's a battle going on between spirit and flesh right now go ahead and tap into the spirit put the flesh on the altar your soul is going to thank you for it heaven is here to meet with us heaven is here to bless us go ahead and push on through the flesh a little bit right now until you're praying in the spirit until you're worshiping in the spirit that's it. You're feeling the glory. You're feeling the refreshing come over you. I kind of, you're doing more than being emotional. You're shaking the foundations. There's spiritual warfare going on right now. Your victory is in your praise. Just let it wash over you. I wouldn't be observing everybody thinking, oh, that's cool, that's cute. I'd be tapping into the flow of the Holy Ghost right now. It's flowing in this house. Push past your flesh. Let the Spirit reach up and touch the God Spirit right now.
Oh, I wonder if we can lift our hands all over this place. The song says that we have a right to praise him. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that I can be in the house of the Lord. And I can praise the one who created me. I can praise the one that called me out of darkness. We have a right to praise him tonight. Oh, one more time, lift your hands and praise him. The Bible it commands us to praise ye the Lord. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Hallelujah, we praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, we praise you tonight, God. The Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. That means that when we praise him, that he comes and he dwells, and he literally sits among his people when we begin to praise and lift up praises to the name of Jesus. So what has transpired in this place is we've lifted up the name of Jesus. We've praised him tonight. and his presence, we can feel it here with us today. So what better place and what better time than to lift up our needs unto the Lord tonight. I don't know about you, but I have needs in my life. And God is able to meet not just my need, but every need in this house, every need that is connected to individuals in this place. We want to lift up the name of the Lord for my wife, my, my wife's mother, my mother-in-law battling cancer. We want to remember Marlene and Al Rivard. We want to remember Doug Weber. We want to pray for a special need tonight. Remember Sister Elder Sanson, the Sanson family. Her brother passed away. We want to remember this family and our need and our prayers tonight that God would comfort and touch them tonight. Would you lift up your hands with me in faith? Let's go to the Lord, name of Jesus, to the Lord tonight. Hallelujah, God. We thank you, Lord, that your presence, Lord, we feel it in this house, God. We worship you. We praise you, God, for your presence in this place. We know, God, that you are here with us, Lord, and that every need, Lord, that is spoken and unspoken, you hear it, God, and you see it tonight, Jesus. We pray that you would touch my mother-in-law, God, by battling cancer, Lord. We know, Lord, that you are able to touch every cancer, Lord, and to heal, Lord, every disease, Jesus. We pray for Doug Weber, for Marlene and Al. We Lord, that you would touch and minister these needs tonight, Lord. We pray for Sister Elder Sanson, the Sanson family, God, in this time, Lord, that you would comfort them, Lord. God, that you would touch them, Jesus, Lord, that you would be with them tonight, God, every need in this house, Lord. We lift it up unto you tonight. Can someone clap your hands into the Lord and thank him. Thank him for the answer to prayers. Thank him to the healing that is in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. You may be seated. I want to remember this Thursday and Friday, there's a few things going on across the city, across the state. There's a Spanish conference at Worship and Word, both on Thursday and Friday night. Um, each one of those nights starts at 7.30 p.m. If you're interested in that, that is available to us, uh, as well as Thursday and Friday, same time, 7.30, but at Christ Temple. Um, Brother Campatella will be preaching a youth revival, youth rally service there. I know um, my wife and I, our young people, will be heading there. Um, it's open to everybody. It's not just for youth, so we encourage you to be there if you're able to. I promise Brother Campatella will minister. He will minister to us in that place. It's going to be incredible. And then Saturday, 2 p.m., Northern Youthquake in Prescott Valley. We'll be taking our young people up there. This is a district youth event. It's going to be happening at Prescott Valley Praise Center Church at 2 p.m. on Saturday. The next Sunday night, mark your calendar, special time next Sunday night, Matthew 25 night. That's when we invest in those in our talents and those that are interested in being involved with music, with singing. So if you're interested in that, please see Sister Cleveland. If you will stand with me, we're going to come and give the Lord our tithes and offerings. You can drop it here in the plate. You can text to give tonight. You can give digitally on my left. Come out and give tonight. Get out and greet one another in Jesus' name.
Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Would you stand with me to your feet before we get into the word of the Lord? So happy to see everyone in God's house on this Wednesday night following holiday on the 4th. And I'm thankful the people I, were hang I was hanging out with last night at their home and some of the things that they were engaged with were fireworks. I came, they glad they came to repent of the illegal fireworks, but it sure was fun. And I'm also glad they still have all their fingers and toes attached as well. It feels good in the house of the Lord. Amen. Thankful to be in God's house. Brother Darion, that's the way song service is supposed to be. It's obvious he prayed song service through before he ever had song service. And that's the way it ought to be. Thank you so much for, for taking it seriously. And you're not just filling in space, but... You wanted to know what's the song for tonight, God, and how are we going to sing it, how are we going to do it. It's obvious he'd already had that song service go through his mind probably about a hundred times before he ever got here because he's able to tap into the flow of the Holy Ghost and drag the rest of us behind him. Amen. Aren't you glad to be in church? Let's lift our hands. I'm going to let you be seated in just a moment. But let's lift our hands. I want you to give God a great shout of praise in this house. The greatest praise you've given him all day. I love you, Jesus. I bless you and I praise your holy name. God, there's no one else like unto you. You are great and you are mighty and you are powerful. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, I magnify you. I bless you. I praise you, Jesus. Uh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless your name. Put your hands together uh, and clap your hands and shout to God. Open your mouth up. Open your mouth up and shout for the victory. Uh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, the there's victory in your shout. If you got a need, I just shout a little more. Everyone else is being quiet. Do you want your victory? How desperate are you right now? Amen, amen. You may be seated tonight. We started a series last Wednesday night on Essentials to Acts Revival. We're going to continue that. It's good to have everyone in the house of the Lord. Aaron, it's so good to see you and your family. Love you all dearly. It's wonderful to see how that baby has grown in the hand of God. She is a miracle, and we thank God for that. It's also good to see Juliet back with us again tonight, enjoying the presence of the Lord. Amen. And I'm glad the church family is here. There's nothing like the body of Christ. We began a series last week about essentials to an Acts revival, and we covered lesson number one was that of faith. We're going to continue that tonight. I'm going to recap very briefly what we covered last week, and then we'll get into tonight's lesson on essentials to an Acts revival, and tonight's lesson is on repentance. And you say, well, pastor, you ever more preached repentance every way it could be preached on Sunday. No, I didn't. There's so much more we could cover in repentance. There's so much more we could cover in repentance, and uh, I feel it's right that we go ahead and teach on this tonight. In fact, this was the very first lesson that was dropped into my spirit in, in this series, but I had to backtrack and cover faith first of all. And so we began talking last week, the book of Acts. Is anyone thankful for the book of Acts? And I hope you're doing your reading through the next several weeks in the book of Acts in addition to your regular Bible reading. The book of Acts, it's not just a history book, although it is history, and it shows the birth of the apostolic church. The book of Acts is our blueprint. It is our standard. It is our plan for today's apostolic church. And as one reads through the book of Acts, there are several things that jump out that are essential to a book of Acts revival. You can't have book of Acts without these elements being a part of it. We defined essential as being absolutely necessary, extremely important. If it is essential, then there is no substitute for it. And the very first essential we covered last week was that of faith. And we read from Acts chapter 1, which is where we'll read in just a little bit tonight, the listing of the disciples that gathered in the upper room along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and some women, and some other disciples 
And from that passage, we learned that faith was an element. You're scratching your head saying, how in the world is that possible? It was just the roll call of those that were in that upper room. But when you look at the totality of Scripture, and you go back and see that Jesus had commanded them, go and tarry in the city of Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. They had to believe what Jesus said, and they had to believe on it enough to act upon it. And that is what faith is. It's not just a mental assent. It is believing in something enough to act upon it. And they had faith, for they believed Jesus, uh, and they acted on it. Faith is believing the Word of God and then acting on it. Does anyone want a Book of Acts revival in this day and hour? It's happening all over the world. I say, why not here? And if we're going to have a Book of Acts revival, it's essential to have faith. And you can't go down to the Bible bookstore. You can't go to Christian book distributors and order it online. There's only one way to get faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of the Lord. You need an injection of faith in your faith tank. Uh, pick up the Word of God. Start reading it. Uh, start memorizing it. Start listening to it, uh, and you're going to see your faith soar for great things. Amen. Let's go to Mark chapter 14 tonight. We're going to go to Mark chapter 14, verses 43 through 50, and then we will go to Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. I'll let you remain seated. Mark chapter 14, verse 43. And immediately while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that had betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come... He goeth straightway to him, and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him, and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword. And when you read parallel passages, you know that that was Peter. He took a sword, and smote a servant of the high priest. Again, a parallel passage will tell you that was a man by the name of Malchus. And he cut off his ear. When you really study that out, I believe Peter was trying to cut his head off and not his ear. Verse 48, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple, teaching, and you took me not. But the Scriptures must be fulfilled. Pay attention to verse 50. And they all, everyone say all, and they all forsook him and fled. They all forsook him and fled. Acts chapter 1, verses 12, 13 through 14. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James, verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. My aim tonight is to persuade every one of us from these two passages that if you're going to have a book of Acts experience, encounter, revival, repentance must be a part of it. Before we get into that, let's define what repentance is. I'm going to give you a very formal definition from a Bible dictionary. This Bible dictionary states there are three Greek words used in the New Testament to denote repentance. I'm going to butcher these when I pronounce them. The verb metamelomai is used of a change of mind, such as to produce regret or even remorse on account of sin, but not necessarily a change of heart. They're sorry for what they did, but they're not sorry enough to change. This is the word used in reference to the repentance of Judas in Matthew chapter 27 and 3. He tried to repent but was unable to. That's that word. I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry I did what I did, but I don't think there's any recovery from it. The second word is metanoo, meaning to change one's mind and purpose as the result of afterknowledge. 
If I would have known then what I know now, I wouldn't have done that. And I want to correct action. This verb with the cognate noun, metanoia, is used of a true repentance. It is a change of mind and purpose in life to which remission of sin is promised if they follow through with this. True biblical repentance consists of a true sense of one's own guilt and sinfulness. You will never fully repent as long as the blame is on someone else. Well, they made me do it. No, they didn't. They may have allured you. They may have tempted you, but it was your choice. The devil made me do it. No, he didn't. He doesn't have that much power. If he had that much power, none of us would be living for God. He may have tempted you, but you made a choice. And so it's a true sense of one's own guilt and sinfulness. It matters not if for ten generations prior to you, everyone was a habitual sinner. You can't say, oh, it's a generational curse. No, you have a choice. You can be a cycle breaker. You can break out of that trap and provide a home and a family for your children afterwards that never knows the junk you had to face. You're not trapped by that. I feel like I'm hitting some speed bumps here. You have a choice. And so you've got to own up and say, it's my sin, it's my guilt, it's my shame. That's true repentance. That's the first part of it. It also consists of an apprehension of God's mercy, realizing if I repent, I've got to fall into the mercy of God. There's no hope for me outside of the mercy of God. And third, I love this part. It is an actual hatred of sin. I know there's, there's the saying, God is love, but there's some things God hates. And if you want a successful life living for God, learn to love the things God loves and hate the things God hates. I'll love the person doing the things that God hates, but I will not love their actions. We've got to have an actual hatred of sin. That's true repentance. Psalms 119, 128 states it like this way. And this is the spirit you've got to get upon you. I hate every false way. I hate every false way. And it also is the same thing referenced in 2 Corinthians seven ten that godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. It is a true repentance is a persistent endeavor after a holy life in walking with God in the way of His commandments. So let me put all that together. Number one, it's realizing it's my sin, it's my guilt, no one made this, me do this, it is my fault. I have made these choices. I'm in the place I'm in because of my choices. Number two, my only hope is in the mercies of God. That's my only hope. Number three, I hate what sin has done to my life. Sin is going to feel good. If it didn't feel good, no one would be sinning. It's going to feel good for a season. But seasons change. And the tab comes for the bill afterwards. And so it's going to feel good for a season. But you've got to get that actual hatred of sin. And it's saying, I hate what sin has done to my life. I hate what sin has done to our society hate what sin's done to my family, and I hate sin so much, I'm going to make a change of direction and start walking in the paths and the ways that God has for me and experience His blessings. So that's what repentance is. And from our text in Mark 14 and Acts 1, I believe I can persuade you tonight that repentance is necessary for a book of Acts encounter. From our passage in our text, it's clear that repentance is an essential for a book of Acts experience. Peter is one of, the, one of the colorful ones of the disciples, and Peter is so often given a bad rap and has become the scapegoat for the rest of the disciples while we give a pass to all the other disciples. I mean, and Peter, rightfully so, he should get a bad rap. He didn't do everything right. He gets pain in a bad light because he was confronted by Jesus. Jesus warned him, Peter, I'm telling you, Peter, you're going to deny that you know me three times. Uh-uh, Lord, I'm ready to die and go into prison with you. No, Peter, I'm telling you the truth. You should know this by now. I don't lie. 
Peter, you're going to deny me. <laughs> Jesus, you got the wrong one. You're probably thinking of James or John, the sons of thunder. Not me. You gave me the keys to the kingdom. I'm not going to deny you. Peter, I tell you, before the cock crows, you have denied me three times. And then it is Peter. He is the one who attempted to defend Jesus when they rushed him with the scribes and Pharisees to arrest him, and he ends up cutting off Malchus's ear. So he's like, see, Jesus, I told you I was going to defend you until the very end. But when Jesus is being tried, Peter is warming himself by a fire, and this little damsel comes up and says, aren't you one of those Jesus guys? And he says, oh, no, not me. No, you look like him. You talk because you can't be around Jesus without start resembling him. I, I'll just, I'll leave that alone for another day. And she tells him over and over, I think, and he denies Jesus three times uh, and even curses, and then he hears the rooster crow. And so we paint him in a bad light because of his failures. Would you agree that he had some failures? But it was not just Peter that denied Jesus. All, we read in Mark 14 and 15, all the disciples forsook him at his arrest. Picture this in your mind. They're in the garden. Jesus has finished his prayer meeting. And all of a sudden, they hear a rumble of footsteps. And the soldiers and a multitude, the Bible says, and the chief priest and the scribes and the elders they surround Jesus, and Judas gets close enough to place a kiss upon his cheek and betray him. And the moment that the, he is kissed, Peter, the crowd rushes in, the soldiers rush in, Peter raises his sword, get Malchus's right ear, Jesus heals it, and at that moment, the Bible says, all the disciples forsook him and fled. So you got Jesus. He's getting hauled off by the soldiers this way. And all the disciples, they don't go with Jesus. I don't know if they went in one group. They probably scattered every different direction. But they went, Jesus is going this way with soldiers. And they all go, you got to capture this. They all go in the opposite direction of Jesus. They forsook him. They left him and they fled Jesus. And then when we get in Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, the very disciples that fled from Jesus at his betrayal now are gathering where he instructed them together. Notice the change in direction. I hope this isn't too elementary for you. At first, they fled from him. They went the opposite direction. And now they willingly and with great anticipation, uh, gather where he commanded them together. Do you recognize that there had to be a moment uh, of repentance? Because true biblical repentance uh, is not saying, I'm sorry. It's sorry enough to change my direction. They were going in the op. Come here, Darion. You're Jesus right now. Jesus is going that way. Just go, Jesus. I just told Jesus what to do. And all the disciples, they go in the other direction. But between Mark 14 and Acts chapter 1, all of a sudden, they had a moment where they said, I forsook him. I fled. I denied him. I've got to change my direction, for thou hast the words of eternal life. No doubt it came back to their mind when everyone else had denied Jesus. And Jesus said, will you also leave me? And Peter said, we have nowhere else to go. But yet they did go to another place. And all of a sudden, they're going here and there and everywhere in opposite direction from Jesus. But they have a moment of repentance where they say, God, I'm sorry. And I'm changing my direction. It's not repentance like Judas had, where it was just feeling bad, but no change of heart and no change of direction. But it was true biblical repentance, where they felt bad for what they had done. They felt bad enough to change direction and recognize we must fall into the mercies of God. And so they changed their direction. And Jesus said, you can be seated now, Jesus. Thank you very much. And Jesus said, 
said, go wait in an upper room for me in Jerusalem. And so they said, he's been taken. He's been, he's been crucified, buried, resurrected. He's, asc- he's ascending. But he told us to gather in an upper room and he'd meet with us with the promise of the Father. And so I'm not going to go back to the garden where I left him. I'm going to change the direction from going the opposite direction. And I'm not going to go where I left him. I'm going to go where he told me to go. I'm going to go into the upper room and wait for the promise of the Father. Friends and church family, that was a moment of repentance. They moved from fleeing from Jesus to gathering where he instructed them to go. It was a change of direction. It was a change of life because repentance is more than God, I'm sorry. It is a change of direction. Would you lift your hands and thank God for the moment of repentance and the opportunity of repentance that he blesses us with. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Is there anyone in this house, you've ever had your GPS on and it's barking out directions at you, turn left in 700 feet, continue straight for 3.2 miles, take a left on Main Street. And you get caught up listening to the song that's playing. Or you get caught up in conversation. Or something catches your attention. And you miss the turn. And you're going in the wrong direction. And what does GPS do? It says rerouting. It's rerouting. What's it trying to do? It's trying to get you back on the proper pathway to your proper destination. That is what repentance is. It's God's rerouting system in life. Even after you've been saved, we all miss a turn at times. We miss a commandment of God at times. We miss an instruction. We miss a moment. And we continue on a path that's taken us from the destination God has for us. Heaven and eternity with Him. And what does God do? He doesn't say, oh, Go find your own way. I don't care. Uh, Go to hell. I don't care. Uh, No. He says, I'm rerouting you. Uh, I'm trying to get you back. The goodness of God is rerouting you and leading you to an altar uh, of repentance. Uh, And the goodness of God is rerouting you. You say, don't don't go down that street. You're going the wrong way uh, on a one-way street. Uh, It may look like a really good road, uh, but broad is the way that leads to destruction and narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting I know it looks like a good road but you cannot lean unto your own understanding but in all your ways you better acknowledge him and he will direct and redirect and reroute your path it felt really good in my flesh to take this road and miss those commandments but God says uh uh Sansom you need to get back you need to reroute to a place of repentance, uh, not just saying I'm sorry, uh, but getting you back in the direction uh, you're supposed to be going. Uh, You are headed in the wrong direction, uh, and God reroutes you through repentance uh, back on the path. Uh, Thank God. God for the moments of repentance. I have a question for you today. Where would we be without repentance? I'll tell you where we would be lost in hell for all of eternity. And so I'm going to ask you again with that understanding, would someone lift your hands and thank God for opportunities of repentance today? I should not be here, but God rerouted me. I I found a place of repentance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God for repentance. Thank you, Jesus, for repentance. Bless your name. It's obvious to me that the disciples that gathered in the upper room found a place of repentance. From the time of their betrayal until their tearing in an upper room. 
I feel like I've persuaded you of that point. What's interesting to me is those disciples were going to preach repentance. But before they could preach repentance, they first had to practice repentance. Before you can be telling everyone else you need to repent and get right and have advice, you better get your inner person. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. You better take care. Lift our, let's lift our hands and talk to God right now. There is such an unction in this house right now. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be for the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Before you are able to spout out spiritual advice and direct everyone in the direction they should go, you better make sure your life is right. You better make sure your heart is in submission and your spirit is in submission or else you're going down a pathway of hypocrisy. And before they could preach repentance, they first had to practice repentance. When you look throughout the book of Acts, we always think of outpourings of the Holy Ghost, baptism, miracles, signs, and wonders. But when you look in the book of Acts, repentance was preached and it was practiced throughout the book of Acts. The very first mention of it, I showed you an example of it without it being mentioned. But the very first mention of it is in Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is the first message of the church preached by Peter. He preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What I just read to you was not his message. It was his answer. He preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This was his application of the message he just preached. They cried out after they heard about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. said, what do we have to do to be saved? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. And so he gives an application, or the, t- the very first takeaway Peter gave from the very first message of the church was repent. Repent. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, Peter is speaking from Solomon's porch in the temple following the miracle of the, main, of the lame man. And he states to repent and that conversion, blotting of sins and times of refreshing would follow. In Acts chapter 5 verse 31 it states, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Peter has just been delivered from prison with other apostles And he stands and he begins to preach repentance. Now, I believe Peter was moved on by the Holy Ghost, but I think there was a little bit of flesh there as well. Because no doubt the ones that had arrested him were standing there hearing him. And he's telling them they need to repent as well. You'll catch that later. Acts chapter 8 verse 22 states, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God that perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Peter has been approached by Simon the sorcerer. He's desiring to buy the power to lay hands on people so they can receive the Holy Ghost. And Peter tells him, you need to repent of the wickedness in your heart and pray to be forgiven. In Acts chapter 11, verse 18, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. The apostles and brethren in Judea had gathered together. They wanted to hear Peter's account of Cornelius being converted. They're like, I'm not sure this was a God thing because he's a Gentile and we're Jew. I don't know if this is good and I don't know if this is right. Peter gives his account of it and states the Gentiles have been granted repentance unto life and they received it. But notice it included repentance. In Acts chapter 13 verse 24, when John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Paul is preaching in Antioch here and he references John the Baptist preaching repentance. I'm talking about repentance was preached throughout the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 17 and 30, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men, that's us, commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Paul is speaking to the men in Athens on top of Mars Hill, preaching about the the altar to the unknown God and introducing to them. And he preaches to them, God that I'm preaching to you about is commanding that men everywhere needs to repent. In Acts chapter 19 and 4, Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. 
saying unto the people they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. Paul is preaching in Ephesus, and he references and validates the ministry of John the Baptist and his message of repentance. Just stay with me tonight. Acts chapter 20 and verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is speaking to the Ephesian elders, and uh, he testifies that we must, everyone say we must, we must have repentance towards God. And finally, in Acts chapter 26 and 20, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Paul is standing before King Agrippa, and he testifies how he preached repentance and that there would be works of repentance as well. In other words, it's not just going to be lip service. Uh, you're going to see fruit of that repentance. Uh, all throughout the book of Acts, you find mentions of repentance. Uh, in fact, there are ten instances there. Do you believe that the Holy Ghost is necessary? Do you believe that baptism in Jesus' name is necessary? When you count up the number of Holy Ghost in fillings, uh, as far as recorded in Scripture, and the number of baptism in Jesus' name in the book of Acts, uh, there are far more references to repentance in the book of Acts uh, than there are to the Holy Ghost, uh, or than there are to baptism in Jesus' name. And those are both necessary, and they are both valid. What I'm trying to convey to you tonight uh, is you cannot have an Acts revival, you cannot have a book of Acts church uh, without a message of repentance. But before you can preach a message of repentance, you must first individually live a life of repentance. We could have crowd growth but not have repentance. You could have crowd growth and pack this place out five times on Sunday, but the moment you start preaching repentance, that crowd is going to be like Jesus' crowd and dis disappear. You may have a crowd, but not a church. You may experience crowd growth, but not church growth. If you want a book of Acts experience, that's what I want. I don't want flesh. I don't want your ability. I want a divine, a sovereign blowing like it was in this house during, during, uh, during worship service. Darion did not practice that. I say, okay, I'm going to do this dance. It's going to make them move. No, he was moving under the inspiration and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. That's what I want. I want a move of the Holy Ghost. I want a book of Acts experience where people say that is certainly a hand and the touch of God. Man could not do it. And if you want that, it is essential. There is no substitute. We must have a life of repentance, a message of repentance, and a church of repentance. Would you lift your hands and love Jesus right now? Bless your name. Bless your name. You remember the first time you repented of your sins? The very first time. And you got up and you felt so good. It felt amazing. That's how it should feel every time we repent. And so if it felt that good, why not repent on a regular basis? John the Baptist was the preacher of repentance in the Word of God. Just about every prophet that came, they came with a message of repentance. Turn from your wicked ways. But John the Baptist is held as the preacher of repentance. And his purpose was to prepare the way of the Lord. And that tells us something. John came preaching repentance, preparing the way for the Lord. The application for that is, uh, for us is this. Repentance prepares a pathway for God in our life. Man, I just can't feel God. Have you tried repenting? Well, I don't think I'm doing anything wrong. doesn't matter. A life of repentance will prepare a pathway for the presence of God. Take me to any great revival in history, and I'll show you it always started with a pathway of repentance. Take me to any crusade where thousands upon thousands are receiving the Holy Ghost overseas, and the very first thing they do is they pray a prayer of repentance. 
Well, we prayed it last night. So, that was 24 hours ago. Let's pray repentance again. And God always responds to that pathway of repentance. In John's preaching, he used the phrase, you got to bring forth fruits for repentance. He's implying that if one repents, it will be visible in their life. How do you know it's an apple tree? You see apples on it. How do you know it's an orange tree? You see oranges on it. How do you know someone's living a life of repentance? You see the fruit of repentance in their life. What does that mean? The fruit of repentance is change in an individual's life. I'm sorry. This is not repentance. I'm headed towards sin. That wall is sin. And I stop here on a Sunday morning and say, God, I'm so sorry. And you go through three boxes of Kleenex and everyone's emotional and you're snotting and you're crying and tearing. God, I'm so sorry. And you get up and you keep walking towards that repentance. There's no fruit of repentance. That was an emotional display. It was You were moved by emotions. You were not moved by conviction. You were moved by emotion. Because true repentance, uh, there's always fruits of repentance. You will know them by their fruits. Uh, you know if someone's repented by the change that is in their life from repentance. Uh, repentance doesn't get up uh, and return to their wallow and, and mire and the, and the mud. They get up and get out of the sin that they're in uh, and start walking towards the path of God. They stop fleeing from Jesus like the disciples did. Uh, and they start pursuing Jesus. Uh, sin always makes you go away from God. That's why Adam and Eve, they ate of that fruit in the tree of the garden. And God shows up with mercy. That's how God is, a space of mercy and grace. Adam, Eve, where are you? I'm ready, I'm ready to have my talk with you today like we always do. I sure look forward to it. And they're hiding themselves because sin separated them. But when you repent of sin, you eradicate the sin, you stop fleeing from Jesus, and you start pursuing Jesus. So true repentance is not saying, I'm sorry here on a Sunday and walking towards that wall of sin is saying I'm sorry and getting up and turning my back on that sin and walking in the opposite way and saying my paths are ordered by God he's got a holy highway for me he's got a straight and narrow path for me it may be rough it may be tight but it's going to lead me to life everlasting there will be fruits of repentance in one's life there will be a change there's a better way to live than saying sorry and going back to sin it's called repentance, uh, learning to hate the sin uh, and what it does to you. How can I get such a hate for sin? You need to start looking at the end of sin and not the beginning of sin. The beginning of it looks very good, but the end of it, I've got, I've got a full lesson on it. It looks terrible. It, it's, it's the guy that starts off thinking, oh man, smoking cigarettes and tobacco, it's great. It doesn't show them they're hacking their lungs up with lung cancer. It looks great to the, to the college and career that's out living a very immoral lifestyle, sleeping around with every guy or girl and in parties and on and on and on, and it doesn't show them suffering with HIV and AIDS. That's the end of sin. You want to learn to get a hatred for sin? Start looking at the end of the matter instead of a beginning of the matter. And then when you see the end of it, it's like, God, I don't want to go that direction. I'm going to repent. I'm going to do an about face. I'm going to change my direction and start walking in the paths of God. John even gave examples of fruits of repentance. Look at Luke chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. Again, his purpose was to prepare the way of the Lord. He came preaching repentance. Preaching of repentance, practicing repentance, prepares a pathway for God. He said, if you repent, there's going to be fruits of repentance. Then he gave examples of this in verses 10 through 14 of Luke 3, because the people asked him, saying, what shall we do then? Look what John said in, in, in Luke three eleven. He answered and said to them, he that has two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. He that hath meat, let him do likewise. Repentance changes your attitude. Changes you from selfishness to unselfishness. Instead of hoarding, and I'm not going to share, and I'm not going to bless someone, it keeps it all for themselves. Verse 12, then came also publicans to be baptized. So they were tax collectors and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And the publicans, they had quite a racket going they would go to the people and say, they would know what the tax bill was. Your tax bill for the year, Austin Felty, is $400. 
And so they would come because he didn't understand the law like the publicans did. The publican would come up and say, Mr. Felty, your tax bill's $600. And they'd pay $400 to the government and put $200 in their pocket. Boy, some things never change, do they? <laughs> and the publican said, well, what are we to do? And John said to him, take, verse 13, take no more than that which has appointed you. Repentance brings you from dishonesty to honesty. Verse number 14, the soldiers came out to hear John preach as well and asked him, say, in verse 14, what shall we do? He said unto them, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. True, this is what I gather from these, these four points. Number one, true repentance involves, or this point, and I'll give you the examples of it. True repentance involves action, and it involves change. True repentance is not crocodile tears saying, I'm sorry, so sorry that I was such a fool. You heard that Sunday. We won't go through that again. It involves action and change. If you got two coats or meat, stop being selfish. Give some away. Tax collectors, stop stealing from people. Soldiers, get rid of the violence. Do not falsely accuse and be content with your wages. Repentance will involve action and change is point number one. Point number two, repentance is not just for one class of people. It is for all people. It was for soldiers. It was for politicians. It was for tax collectors. And it was for the people. True repentance is for everybody, and it will bring a change to everybody's life. But where did John, you got to picture this, there hadn't been an anointed prophet preaching for 400 years. That's why everybody gathered out. You would not want John the Baptist to be your evangelist or your preacher. He was not polished. He was not politically correct. He looked out at a group of them one day, said, you bunch of snakes. I'm looking better all the time right now. You bunch of snakes. Another t- it just, I mean, he was rough. Where did John, and that's why the people flocked. They hadn't heard an anointed prophet for 400 years. Where did John get this concept of a baptism of repentance? He came preaching repentance. He came preaching the baptism of repentance. Obviously, it was given by God. But the concept of it came from the tabernacle. I remember reading about that tabernacle. There was a very first thing you would encounter was a brazen altar. And that's where the sacrifice was laid down and killed and the fire consumed it. The brazen altar was a place of death. It is a type of repentance. Repentance is not sorry. It's a place of death. Saying, God, I'm dying out to my flesh. I'm dying out to my sin so your spirit can live inside of me. And then he would go to the brazen laver and wash all the mess of the sacrifice off of him. It was a place of death, and then it was a place of cleansing. That's where John got this baptism of repentance. And he, uh, Hebrews and Corinthians both tell us that these things were written for examples or for a hint for us. And when one went into the tabernacle, just bear with me, I'm almost done. They went to that brazen altar. They went to the brazen laver. But they didn't stop there. They wanted the sacrifice to be carried all the way in. The blood sprinkled upon the Holy of Holies where the glory of God would come down and meet with the high priest and that person's sins would be rolled ahead for one year. They wanted that God experience. They wanted the glory of God to come down and meet. But to get to the Holy of Holies, the glory of God experience, they had to first find a place of repentance, death, and cleansing. When we read in Acts, and we're spending a lot of time in Acts over the next several weeks on Wednesdays, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2. I could start preaching it right now, get you guys on the instruments. We turn this place upside down, act in apostolic. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting there, appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. You know what that was? That was the glory of God coming down 
and fallen upon them. But it wasn't just fallen on a mercy seat because a veil had been broken. A veil had been rent letting people know it's not just the high priest once a year, but it's every believer. It's every person can experience the glory of God and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. But just as there was a very certain pathway to the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, there is a pathway to an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And it always starts at an altar of repentance. An altar, it is a place of prayer, but you can have a prayer life and not have an altar. An altar is a place where we die out to sin and we repent of things and we learn to hate the sin and we eradicate it out of our life and we change our direction and start pursuing the things of God. If you want a Holy Ghost outpouring in this church, there's only one path to get there. It's not guest friendly. It's not seeker friendly. Uh, it's not changing the message, uh, but it's preaching against sin, uh, but not just preaching against sin, uh, preaching a way out of sin. Uh, loving the sinner enough to say what you're doing is wrong, uh, but there's a place of repentance uh, where I can die out to that sin uh, and I can change my direction. Uh, I can never do it on my own. You're absolutely right, uh, but you got to repent of it and change your direction uh, to pay a place uh, for the Holy Ghost, the glory of God to come down within you and then you can say greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. How do you get that power inside of you? Well, there's a few steps where the very first is. You've got to have a place of repentance. PRC, if you want to be a Holy Ghost and fire church, if you want to be a book of Acts church where the Holy Ghost has fallen on a regular basis, if you individually want to be the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you ought to be, you must have a place of repentance. We must be a church of repentance. But before we can be a church of repentance, we must be a person of repentance personally. Would you stand to your feet all over this house right now? I want, I want a book of Acts revival. Uh, I will not stop until I see it uh, from north to south and east and west. Uh, I will not stop until I see them being filled with the Holy Ghost uh, by the hundreds and by the thousands in this place being filled. Uh, and the only way to get there uh, is a place uh, of repentance. Uh, but before you can preach repentance, uh, you must first practice repentance like the disciples did. Uh, would you lift your hands and commit to a life of repentance? I want us to thank God. Let's lift your voice and thank God that God has given us a space of repentance. He's given us the opportunity of repentance. God, we are so grateful you've given us a place of repentance. You give us a place where we can come and turn our lives back to you. We are not perfect, God. We are far from it, but in your great mercy and grace, you give us a place of repentance. You reroute us back towards you and back towards the things of God. Thank you for being merciful towards us. Thank you for a place of repentance. And we give you glory and honor and praise in the name of Jesus. Now I want you to begin repenting before God in your own words, in your own way. God, I'm sorry for every evil word. I'm sorry for every evil deed and every evil thought. Uh, Jesus, I'm sorry for motives that are wrong. Uh, I'm sorry for operating in flesh that has not been crucified. Uh, I'm sorry for leaning to my own understanding and not leaning under your paths and in your ways. Uh, Forgive me, God, of thoughts and ideas and concepts that are contrary to you and your word. Uh, Forgive me of every crooked way in my life, God. Uh, Make me like you. Wash me and cleanse me in your blood, Uh, God. 
God, we're asking this not because we want special power, but because we must be saved in the name of Jesus. Uh, cleanse us and wash us in the name of Jesus, I pray. Uh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, forgive us, O oh God, and prepare us to be your sanctuary. Uh, God, take out every evil way inside of me. Uh, forgive me for not spending the time with you that I should. Uh, forgive me for not being a good steward of time and of resources, God. Uh, forgive me in the name of Jesus, I pray. Uh, prepare me to be your vessel. Uh, prepare me to be your sanctuary. Just keep repenting. Uh, you know what you're doing. Uh, you're paving a pathway for the glory of God into your life that's going to settle today. Uh, God, forgive me. Uh, forgive me of pride and arrogance and cockiness. Uh, forgive me, God, for being short with people. Uh, forgive me for operating from flesh and not from spirit. Uh, in the name of Jesus, would you wash me uh, and would you cleanse me? Uh, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Uh, now would you begin to thank him uh, that he's heard your prayer of repentance, uh, that he's washing you and that he's cleansing you. Uh, I'm not trying to rush through it. I'm being a steward of the time tonight. That's all I'm doing. Uh, you can pick this up tomorrow in your prayer time and spend an hour repenting. Uh, let God wash you and cleanse you. Uh, God, I thank you for cleansing me. Uh, thank you for hearing my prayer of repentance. Uh, you delight not in sacrifices and burnt offerings, uh, but you want a broken and a contrite spirit. Uh, God, we are broken before you and we are sorry for what we have done. Uh, forgive me, God, for living for my flesh. Uh, prepare me, God, to be saved. Uh, we're not doing this with ulterior motives for special anointing, uh, but God, we're doing it in the fear of God. We must be saved. Uh, we must be ready for the rapture. Uh, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Uh, now lift your head towards heaven uh, and lift your hands. We have repented of our sins. Uh, we have prepared for the Holy Ghost right now. Uh, we have prepared a pathway for God to come in. Uh, we have prepared a pathway for the Holy Ghost, the glory of God to settle in. Uh, now would you lift your voice and praise and glory uh, because if we confess our sins, uh, He is faithful and just to forgive us uh, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, and now lift your voice and hallelujahs and praise to God uh, and the Holy Ghost just as a karaboko. It's already blowing in this house uh, just as it blew in in Acts chapter 2. Uh, it's going to blow in not just to this building uh, but into your soul. Alabaka, uh, receive you the Holy Ghost all over this house. Uh, be refilled with the Holy Ghost. Alabaka, uh, go ahead and talk in tongues. Uh, go ahead and talk in tongues. Uh, you prepared a pathway for God. Alabaka. Uh, Hallelujah. I encourage you to lift your head up. We repented in condemnation and shame, but that's been lifted, so you ought to lift your head up ready to receive. Lift your hands like a funnel to receive. Let the Holy Ghost be poured into you right now. If you felt the touch of the Lord tonight, would you put your hands together and give him a hand clap of praise and a shout of victory in this house. I love you and I bless you and I praise you, O oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
we could spend the rest of the night in this place experiencing the glory of God, and it is here, and I'm thankful for it. But I want to tell you, you don't have to wait till Sunday to experience this. I would encourage you tomorrow in your prayer time, if repentance is not a part of your regular prayer life, or if it's a very abbreviated version, or if you don't have a prayer life, engage in it tomorrow and make repentance a major portion of your prayer time tomorrow until you feel the glory of God just surge throughout you. We must, we must be a church of repentance. I want a book of Acts revival. I want to be a book of Acts church. Repentance. Repentance is not optional equipment. It's essential. Lift your hands and give him praise one more time tonight. I love you and I bless your name. Thank you for your presence and your power and your spirit. I love you, Jesus, and I bless you, O oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. By no means was tonight a, an exhaustive study of repentance. It was a very brief highlight. We could study it for an entire year and probably not cover every aspect of repentance. But rather than know everything about it, study it out, yes. It would be better that you just practice it on a regular basis. God bless you today in Jesus' name.